Welcome to Devalue with Mike and Caroline, the place where we talk about art and money and how creative people are navigating the ever-changing landscape or trying to make a living for their work. We're going to be interviewing all types of creative people, and we'll be talking about all types of issues that creative people face. We hope you'll get something out of it. We're excited to welcome you to Devalued. Hey, Mike. Hey, Caroline. Who are we speaking with today? We are talking with legendary recording engineer Steve Albini, who owns Electrical Audio in Chicago and has produced thousands of albums and is in a great band called Chillac. Awesome. Let's do it. Let's do it. At this, <clears throat> I'm at the studio, and when there are other people around, I always have, try to have my mask on. Yeah, so essentially our podcast is really just to help um, creative people understand how to make a living or what it means to make a living in, in the yeah. arts. So, you know, you're like the perfect guest to talk about that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I have I have made a living, so that's I true. <laughs> <laughs> so um, do you think art and money have a natural relationship? Um, no, there's a, I'm not a capitalist. Um, and I don't believe that life needs to be earned. Um, I, I feel like there's a, there's a natural instinct to express uh, the creative impulse in exactly the same way that there's a natural impulse to procreate or to find food or to protect people or, you know, um, uh, so I, I think that the, the creative impulse is as natural as, you know, being, getting hungry. And, uh, I, I don't, I don't see it in the same way that I see other sort of trades and occupations, because those are things you're, you do, you know, you might have an interest in them and you might be adept at them, but you're doing them as a means of earning a living, you know, uh, whereas almost all creative enterprises are done for their own satisfaction. Like I, I make music because it, it's awesome to make music. You know, I'm in a band because it's awesome to be in a band, you know, and <clears throat> and in that sense, uh, it's not surprising that things that are awesome to do are not particularly well compensated, you know? Um, so th the way I've navigated that myself is that I haven't been terribly concerned about trying to make a living uh, as a musician. <clears throat> it's nice when my bands make money and it does contribute to my income but um, I've never tried to make it my full-time occupation that is just being a performing musician. When I got into music, it was in the 1980, early, late 1970s, early 1980s. And it was exclusively, or it was for me anyway, it was through the lens of the punk scene, the independent underground. And in that community, everybody did everything like if you owned um a lot you know if you owned some microphones and a mixer and a, and speakers then you were a pa company for your friends like you you're you know if you had a practice space then all of your friends had a practice space if you had a bass amplifier then everybody at the gig had a bass amplifier it was just the, every it was just presumed that everybody would do everything and, you know, we every all the bands book their own shows. And so if a, if a band called from out of town and said, hey, can you book us a show? You would know where to call and you would book them a show. So you would be acting as a gig promoter, not as a business, not as a professional enterprise, but just because that's how the scene operated. That's how things happened. You know, nothing would happen otherwise. So it's never been a particular ambition of mine it's never been an ambition of mine at all really to make a living as a musician i've always just seen music as something that i will do for the rest of my life and i'll do whatever it takes 
in the margins for me to be able to keep doing it. Um, I've described that frame of mind as, as supporting my interest in music the same way I would support a family, you know, um, and we live in a capitalist society. So I'm obliged to work, to make money, to cover my existence. Uh, and being a musician is part of that. Bear with me. I have to, oh, somebody answered the phones. Great. I'm, I'm actually going to mute this if somebody else is going to answer the phone. So, yeah, I, I think musicians should, I think everybody should be compensated for their work. Like when you're working for somebody else and there's money changing hands, you should get your share of it. That's, that's just, just makes sense. But I also don't see music as the same thing as, um, you know, pulling the entrails out of a fish or um, stuffing things into envelopes or soldering components onto a circuit board. Like there's there's labor and then there's work, which is part of your existence because you you're driven to do it. So the work that I do in music, I'm driven to do it and I'm doing it at my own discretion. No one has you know, I, you know, I'm not trapped punching a clock making music. So I, I think it's, it's a different paradigm to be um, getting com compensated for working in music than it is to, to be getting compensated for doing hourly labor. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically my, like understanding of the relationship between money and music is money changes hands for music. So I want my share of it, but also I I'm not obsessed with um, extracting every possible penny out of my musical existence because the music itself is part of what pays me, you know? And so like when Shellac releases a new album, like how do you measure the success of that new album? Our satisfaction with it is literally the only measure. Um, we've just, we've finished an album some months ago and it's in production now, you know, it's going to be a while before it comes out, but um, just because there are enormous backlogs everywhere, but I'm deeply satisfied with this album, you know, and that's really all that matters to me. If some other people buy it, great, that'll help. <laughs> You know, I, it's not like I won't take the money, but, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we're not doing it for them. Right. And we spoke to Damon Krakowski a few weeks ago, um, and he shares a lot of similar opinions with you. And he was talking about the backlog of vinyl records where yeah. he, him and Damon and Naomi, their project, they were trying to get a vinyl press for months and months, but Harry Styles had eaten up all the capacity. Um, well, I don't want to personalize it too much, but what happened during the pandemic was that there was much less activity in the music scene. People weren't going into studios. People, bands couldn't congregate to rehearse. Or there was, there wasn't touring. So uh, two things conspired. One of them was that record labels decided that they would start going through their back catalog for special anniversary reissues in order to just sort of boil the bones one more time and make soup out of Frank Sinatra one more fucking time or whatever. <laughs> Um, uh, and so a lot of manufacturing capacity was occupied by special editions and premium priced deluxe versions and record store day, um, editions and things like that of catalog stuff, basically just like big record labels, just, you know, going through their archives, putting together special projects because that was the only way that they could keep the wheels spinning during the pandemic. Right. So that's one thing that happened. The other thing that happened was that people were stuck at home. So every fucker with a guitar made a, an album at home. And then all of those albums deserve to be pressed. So then, so you had these two sort of tsunami um, like happening at the same time. One of them is this, just this 
monumental pile of made at home uh, sort of personal records that people were making during the pandemic because they weren't doing any, they were they had time on their hands and they were stuck at home. Right. And then the other one was, you've got an, a massive industry that's trying to exploit its masters um, during a period when there are no new masters being created, you know? So those are the things that conspired to, uh, to absorb all of the, the pressing capacity at the pressing plants. Are you, do you follow like the, the rising cost of vinyl? I know that the editor of the guardian was, was recently made some waves when he was saying that um, he doesn't buy vinyl anymore because it's getting too expensive. Yeah. Everything is getting more expensive. And for a long time, vinyl was priced as a kind of a loss leader, like, in the in the analog era, like bef before digital distribution of music, records were priced at a at a in a way that made them sort of less expensive than their cost in some cases, um, as a as a means of getting them into people's hands. Um, and as long as they maintained um, a very small profit margin, they were it was worth doing for the record labels. It, it the increasing the profit margin would have helped the artists, but that was never in the interest of the record label. So, vinyl records were priced. They they were more expensive to manufacture than compact discs, but compact discs had established a higher list price. So. As the list price of compact discs sort of remained stable, the relative cost of a vinyl record under a compact disc, right, um, became less and less profitable. And so that's the main reason that vinyl records were squeezed out by CDs was that CDs were dramatically more profitable from a manufacturing standpoint. Um, you could sell them for more money, they cost less to make, you know, it, it, it's a fool's errand to try to convince people to lose money on another format. So, so vinyl records were uh, supplanted by CDs to a great extent. And there were a lot of really great bands who had like, whose most active period was during that era and their music was never documented on vinyl. And so there were bands whose music only ever existed on CD and if those bands have become significant, then now they're able to get a vinyl issue because people see the value in owning a physical object that embodies the music. And I, I think it's, you know, the pricing of records is, doesn't bother me at all. Like if I, if I want a record I'm, and it's going to cost me 25 or $30 to have that record, I, I'm spending the 25 or $30. I mean, I've had fucking sandwiches that cost, <laughs> cost me $25, you know, but it, it, like, I don't, it doesn't bother me that things are priced at a price that allows the people who make them to turn a profit and continue doing it. Sustainability is the entire point of this entire exercise. Like you want it to be able to continue indefinitely. And in order to do that, records have to cost, have to be sold for enough to generate a profit after all of the expenses are, are paid. And, you know, every single thing about making a record is more expensive than it used to be, with the exception of studio time. Time in the studio is the one thing that has sort of, that is now like at, you know, lower cost than it has ever been, you know, relative to historical precedent. But all the raw materials, the printing, shipping, like every aspect of making a record and distributing a record is more expensive than it used to be. So it doesn't bother me at all spending, you know, $20, $30 on, a, on an LP. That seems fine. Since we're talking about inflation, do you feel like uh, the fact that everything is more expensive to buy and make that the quality of the music that is being made um, and the people who are able to make it, afford to make it, uh, will decrease? Uh, yeah, I don't I just I just don't see the economic 
aspect of it having that much of an effect on like if if i if if me and my friends want to form a band we're going to form a fucking band we don't care if anyone is going to come see us you know and if that band wants to put out a record they're going to put out a fucking record they don't care really if anybody's going to buy it you know so i don't think does that I mean, the mean- economic stuff, the economic stuff matters at scale. Like if you're a record label and you're putting out many titles, you know, several titles a month and you've got a, a back catalog, you have to keep in print and all that sort of stuff. Then, then it matters on an individual basis, like my band putting out our record and, so, and then putting, hosting it up on Bandcamp or, and you know, all the other venues that there are for people to hear our music i just i just don't think the economics matter at all in terms of music that's being made for its own sake you know does that mean making music is a privilege uh mm, it's an interesting point um rich people have more spare time and rich so you will see more dilettantish music in, during economic downturns. Um, so you do see, you know, little Lord Fauntleroy's acoustic album. Um, <laughs> With you know, lots of great fail, perspective. Yeah. Without fail. Although, and although, I mean, I, I saw things done on a shoestring through the whole punk era and in the independent music underground that survived after it. And so I know that it's possible to have a thriving underground culture with no outside income, with no outside money coming in, just, you know, people doing it by the skin of their teeth and through strength of will. I saw it happen. And I know that it's that's a valid way to to move the culture forward. So. I'm kind of torn between two of my own instincts here. One of my instincts is that um, working people and poor people should have free time and they should be allowed to pursue their muses in the same way that people of leisure are allowed to pursue their their muses. Um, And the way to do that is to subsidize things and create um, public spaces where people can use the common purse to do things of value. The other instinct I have is that I I have seen people scrabble, scrabbling people with no money and no resources, pull things together by banding together as an independent community and pooling their resources and doing things communally and doing things fraternally. I have seen that work as a model. And I benefited from that specifically, like I was part of a collective record label. Um, I felt the generosity and support of my peers when I first came to Chicago and started getting involved in music. Like, uh, I I feel like that sense of solidarity and that community is really, really important. It's a critical aspect of the music scene. But I do feel like as a society, we should be supporting the arts like and there are places in the world where it happens it just doesn't happen in the u.s really and so as an owner of a music studio have you recovered from the pandemic are people um you know because because i know the business was probably booming for you before the shutdown so what, what what has it been like yeah um as we discussed there's there was this sort of period where everything was sort of pent up where nobody could do anything and we're in the period of release now after that where people are sort of unchained and they're coming back to the studio and you know bands are going on tour again earning money which gives them the wherewithal to come into the studio and make records um and as you said you know since prices have gone up record labels are able to turn a profit on physical product so the, there's been a resurgence in the independent record labels because of that. Um, so, and then the PPP money f- was absolutely critical for touring bands that were able to replace their tour at lost touring income. And for um, studios like us, we, you know, like we were shuttered for a period of time and we had to furlough staff very briefly, but the PPP money made it, and you know, and the sort of guaranteed loans that, 
that came along with that made it possible for us to keep everybody on staff and it took the pressure off. Now things have rebounded quite a bit. There's, you know, the studios are busy every day. The one thing that has kind of remained crippled is our, we, we had a very large international clientele. Um, I would say probably 30 to 50% of my business as an engineer was people who were traveling internationally to make records here. And that has not recovered. It's still very difficult to travel. Um, it's still quite dangerous to travel. I don't blame people for not doing it. Um, and also, I think it's probably prudent to, to, to not do a lot of traveling at the moment still. But um, that's the one aspect that hasn't recovered. Um, yeah, there are still, you know, there are shows every night. There are bands on tour everywhere. There are records being made in our studios every day. The one aspect that hasn't rebounded is the sort of international clientele. One of the things I wanted to ask you about is like access, because a lot of um, a lot of like people of your who have your CV are very, um, you know, they they kind of talk from like the top of the mountain, or they're or they're very reserved, or they 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 speak in a, from an Ivy Tower perspective. But you you're very accessible, and you're accessible to new bands. You're expe- you're accessible to anyone who can, um, you know, afford to hire you to. You know, like your doors are open to to the public in, in a yeah. way. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I just I, I feel like this, this is my work, right? This is what I do, and it doesn't particularly matter to me if I'm doing it for millionaires or people broke dick, you know, <laughs> punk rockers. Like, I actually, I've made a lot of great records and I've made a lot of expensive records, and they're not the same thing at all. Like, I've made, I've had fantastic experiences and made great records with people who were literally spending their rent money to to do it. And those experiences have enriched my life. And I want to have more of those experiences. Like I want to be in there every day doing it. And in order to do it every day, that means that, that you can't price yourself to the point where you can only be affordable to rock stars. Number one, there aren't that many rock stars. Uh, and number two, like, you lose your skills if you don't exercise them. Like I would be dubious about going into the studio with somebody who only makes one or two records a year. Like that seems like there's no way that guy can have his chops together. Um, And some people don't like the work. Some people want to work as little as they possibly can get away with and just like make a few records a year and try to get paid, um, you know, a suitcase of money for each of them that, I've never, I haven't been offered that kind of gig for a start. Like I don't like superstars don't come to me. They have their own network of superstar people that they deal with. Um, My bread and butter clientele has been working bands that want to make a nice recording of what they do every day as a matter of practice. And I learned a long time ago that, the way to keep working with the most interesting people is to maintain your connection to that scene, maintain your availability to the, to that stratum, you know, I, I genuinely enjoy my work. It's like, you know, hearing some, like watching somebody hear the playback of a song that's been in their head for years. And they're finally realizing this as a physical manifestation, right? And, and it's real to them and they're seeing the results of all of this time that they put into their art. Right. The being in the room when those people have those, that, that satisfied reaction is really rewarding to me. Um, and that, I mean, that's as good as the money or better. Uh, so I, 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 I'm, you know, I just want to do more of it. I just want to keep making records for people. Well, with how, Thin money is amongst independent bands at the moment. Um, would you say that investing in a good studio album is where they should put their money? I'm reluctant to give advice to people about their money. Like everybody has to cut, you know, like everybody cuts the cake differently. And I, I'm reluctant to give advice. Um, I, 
what I'm what the, a, a nice studio offers that you can't get elsewhere is good equipment, good microphones, good acoustics, trained engineers with a lot of experience. Uh, and that's, you know, you can't substitute for those things. If you have a crappy microphone, you start with a crappy sound. If you have bad acoustics, then you start with a bad ensemble sound. If you have an untrained engineer, then you're going to run into a lot of problems that they're trying to figure out the solutions on the fly, as opposed to knowing what to do in the moment. Uh, so there are advantages to working in a professional studio with a professional engineer and good equipment, but there is a lot of music where frankly, those advantages are kind of wasted. Like if you're making your music in, you know, exclusively in an electronic environment, like if you're making your music on your computer, using, using the editing and processing functions and synthetic instruments and that sort of stuff, if that's how your music finds its voice, then coming to a professional studio to do that is a waste of time. Um, I, I remember reading an interview with um, um, Billie Eilish's brother, who her, her producer, what's his name? Finian? Phineas. Phineas. Yeah. Um, and uh, he was asked, like, why don't you go to a proper studio to make these records? You guys have money now. And he said, whenever I've been in a proper studio, it took him a half an hour to get the aux jack working. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's, you know, like that's absolutely correct. Like he's got a system set up where he can get results like lickety split, right? Why the fuck should he pay other people to learn how to make music for him? That just seems like a, a, like a, a, a wasted effort when he can just carry on and keep cranking it out. Like, that seems perfectly reasonable to me. But in an environment like a proper recording studio, you have other luxuries. Like you can have a fucking nine foot grand piano. You can have a Hammond organ. Uh, you can have fantastic acoustics. You can have your choice of, a, you know, a bunch of really fantastic sounding amplifiers and equipment and, and instruments and things like that. So there's an abundance that you get when you're in a proper studio that you don't have at home. And there's also like, I, I don't think it's nothing that the people who work in, for example, electrical audio have been doing it for years and they, and uh, trained engineers have already solved most of the problems that you're going to have. So you can either have those problems at home and fight your way through them or you can go to a place where you won't have those problems because they know how to defend against them or because they know how to solve them instantly. So it can be more efficient to work in a recording studio with, you know, trained staff and good equipment because you're not struggling so much with the sort of the, the sort of basic natures of things. Um, like I routinely make albums in a couple, three days, like two or three days is plenty of time to make an album if the band is prepared and, if their production ambitions aren't uh, outlandish. So the overall outlay for that, you know, might be on the order of four or $5,000. Whereas if you were to acquire equipment piecemeal and teach yourself how to do things and spend a lot of time on it at home, like you could easily outrun that and still not be satisfied with the end result, you know? So one of the things that you talk about a lot is is the fact of um, getting paid for your time, for your trade, and for your competence. Um, talk a little bit about like the importance of that. Uh, well, there's there are two models for compensation for people that do what I do. That is, recording engineers and producers and people who make records. Um, the traditional music business model was that you would get paid a small fee or a fee. Let's, you know, hope that it's small. And then over the life of the record, you'd get a royalty from the record that would pay you something. Um, and for very successful records and on major labels, that's a, a very lucrative thing for a record producer is to have a piece of, of a record like that that's successful. I've never wanted to work that way. It's always seemed like an insult to the band, to me, 
for for a producer to be paid out of their pocket. And that's where the producer's royalty comes from. It doesn't come out of the general income from the record. It comes out of the artist's share of the royalty. So if an artist is starting on a on a basis of say 12 points of royalty, they're already losing some to their management. They're already losing some to whatever other, um, you know, what other, other things they're beholden to. And then if I get paid a few points, then, you know, it's quite reasonable that you could end up in a scenario where the producer of the record is being paid more than any of the band members, you know, who are the people who have to do all the, all the hard work of creating the music and, and, and making it. And I just think that's an unethical system and I won't participate in it. So the way I've always done things is I've just set a price for my time. Like either I get paid this much a day and it doesn't matter what I'm working on. Or if you propose that I come and do some special project, then you and I will agree on what I'm being paid to do that special project. You know, and it's a one time thing. Like you pay me and we're done. That just seems like a reasonable, very clean, very um, simple way to approach compensation rather than me having to keep tabs on thousands at this point, thousands of individual records and their, you know, and their progress through the world, you know, and then spend forever beating the bushes to try to get paid on all these tiny fractions of a penny that I'd be earning. Like it just seems that seems like torture to me. You know, but also I think it's unethical and I won't do it. I like that you stick to your guns on your ethos. Um, I mean, every, everybody does. It's just that some people's guns are kind of are, are, are less, you know, less rigorous. Like some people's guns are like, you know, I absolutely will not eat human flesh <laughs> unless I get really hungry on a Saturday. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Well, I have kind of an unrelated question um, regarding things that I know about you. Okay. Um, so I know that in the studio, you're kind of notoriously um, withdrawn, I guess, or not. Yeah. You're not trying to impact the sound or the uh, decisions that the band's making. You are also a professional gambler. Uh, so uh, I'm not much of a gambler, no? but I do play poker. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was wondering if you utilized your poker face in the studio. Uh, no, I get asked this some fairly regularly, but playing poker is a very specific discipline relative to general gambling. General gambling is you're offered odds on a proposition or you're making a wager on an outcome and then you just sit back and let it happen. and either you win or you don't win. Right. And that, to me, that, that, that would be an enormously frustrating. And I, and I, and I don't do it. Like I, I've never, I haven't gambled a dollar on, you know, dice or roulette or any of those ridiculous table games. I've never put a bet on a horse. I don't bet on sports. Like all of that stuff to me is, has, uh, I can't influence the outcome why would I ever get involved in uh, something like that where like thousands of miles away, somebody else could fuck up and it would cost me money. Like that just seems, that just seems like a terrible mental framework to be in. Right. So I don't, I don't gamble in that sense. I play cards and, because as a player, I, I have some influence on the outcome. Like I, if I play, if I, if I'm in a fair game and I play well, I expect to win. And so I, I see betting on myself in that manner as something different from uh, gambling in the general sense, where you're just hoping that things turn out your way and you have no influence on them. Right. Um, but for what it's worth, I, I have essentially no utility for that part of my brain in the recording studio. Um, they are completely separate. And I try, I actually, I actually try pretty hard not to let them interfere with each other. Like um, the best example I can give you is that when I'm playing cards, I want to be inscrutable. I want no one to know what I'm thinking. Right. 
you you could refer to that as a poker face, but it's more than that. It's like my physical actions, the 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 hands that I choose to bet and the hands that I choose not to bet. Um, the the way my entire range of hands in a given situation is played, I don't want my opponents to be able to discern anything about my hand from the way I'm playing it. So I want to be inscrutable as much as possible. I'm often trying to induce mistakes on the part of my opponent. I'm often trying to make someone bet a worse hand so that I can raise him, right? Or I'm often trying to make someone fold a better hand so that I can win a pot that I don't deserve, right? So uh, there's an element of influence there where I'm trying to make someone else behave in a certain way. And, and, and those are things that I just, that are completely anathema to me in the studio. Like in the studio, if someone asks me a question, I want them to know what I'm thinking. I want them to be able to trust my response and believe me when I tell them, right? I don't want them to be wondering, I wonder if that's actually what he thinks or if he's just saying that. Like, I don't want that on anybody's mind, right? I also don't want to influence their behavior. I want them to make decisions about their own music. I'm, I'm not trying to make them do one thing or another. And it would bother me if I felt like I had influenced someone to make a mistake on their record uh, because they were trying to please me or because they were trying to, you know, they were influenced by some part of my affect or something like that. So like they're, they're completely different. They have nothing to do with each other. And I try very hard to maintain that separation. I came across this really interesting interview that Jarvis Cocker did around the time of the further complications album, where he was saying that, um, you know, you don't like to form opinions about people's work, but just by being a part of the process, you're altering it somewhat. Um, sure. And he yeah, said that he, reasonable. yeah, and he said that he would argue about that. What? How do you feel about that? Oh no, I I think that's a reasonable take. Um, yes, by being by using my skill set and my defaults as an engineer and my tastes as a mix balance engineer, that sort of thing, I'm I'm trying to satisf satisfy the client. Like my goal is to satisfy the client, um, but I do have like default behaviors and um, like my range of knowledge about music is maybe wider or narrower than the clients, you know, like my understanding of the acoustics and the microphones and the electronics and stuff, maybe likely wider than theirs. And so there may, may be options that I propose to them that they wouldn't have had otherwise. So yeah, there are, there, I do, I'm sure I do have an influence. But what I don't want to do is be responsible for making, what I don't want to do is make the creative decisions. Like things like, you know, should we do it two BPM faster? Or, uh, you know, what do you think about, you know, doing it kind of reggae? You know, like, <laughs> like artistic stuff, like creative decisions like that. I'm no, I'm no good in those situations. I don't know enough about that stuff to have a, an informed opinion. And if we're relying on my tastes, like my tastes as a listener, I'm a fucking pervert, you know, <laughs> like the, the music that I like is a, is a, is a train wreck. The music that I listen to for fun, the music that my band makes is ugly and unpleasant. Like why would you trust somebody like that with your ballad or something, you know, like, why would you let that guy try to tell you, you know, what key to play the song in? Like for fun, you should play it in a key where you can't reach, right? You should sing out of your range so you're falling flat on your face all the time. That would be <laughs> hilarious, right? <laughs> like I, I, I just, yeah, I'm, I'm not qualified to make artistic decisions for other people, and I don't want to do it. Yeah, that's so interesting, and I'm glad you mentioned uh, the the music that your band makes because your band does have a really intense aesthetic uh every album has a very unique identity um how do you how did you discover that and how did you go about keeping that true well when we started the band we had a sort of small short list of core principles that we wanted to pursue in the band um the first one and the most important one was it, it was just going to be the three of us like 
no, we weren't really interested in broadening the palette by dragging in other people or making, you know, like adding guests or having, you know, string sections or whatever that, that you know, basically we were interested in seeing what we could do. The three of us with our three natural instruments, just pursuing that, you know, and then from a stylistic standpoint, we never put any, boundaries on it whatsoever we just we're just pursuing music that interests us interests us and sometimes the reason it interests us is because it's something about it is un, is unsatisfying or like we're worried in the way that you like pick at a scab or whatever like there's something that's bothering me about this piece of music we're playing so let's let's play it more let's work on it more and that's you know, every band has these kind of conversations, but we've made ours kind of our only guide, our only roadmap. Like we didn't start out emulating another band. We didn't start out, you know, like intending to play like vegan thrash metal or whatever. Like we didn't, we, there was no archetype for what, what we were trying to do. We just wanted to pursue what interests us in the moment and we weren't going to listen to anybody else or like we weren't going to ha- take advice from anybody else. I think that's a, a, a great way to maintain your band's identity is to not care what other people think about it. You know, I agree with that. The, the band has survived a very long time. And part of the reason that it survived as long as it has, I've been in shellac for over 25 years. And the reason the band has survived that long is because we've never allowed it to make demands of us. It's never been our sole, anybody's sole, sole source of income. We've always treated the money that we made out of the band as a kind of a windfall. Um, we've never felt obligated to record or tour or do anything. It's always done as an indulgence, like as a matter of pure joy for us. Like I, we have a tour coming up in a couple of weeks. We're going to be playing the West coast. I'm looking forward to it. Like Christmas, you know, we were locked up under the pandemic. We interrupted a tour at the start of the pandemic. And then we had a tour rescheduled twice um, because of the pandemic. Um, We've done a couple of short tours recently and it was reinvigorating to be out playing music again. And I'm really looking forward to it. Having said that, it's nothing like a job. It's nothing like a career. Like if I wanted to try to make a living purely as a musician, I probably could manage, but it would be a very meager existence. And I would end up doing a lot of things that I would be embarrassed by. Like would end up putting out records that I wasn't proud of and making, doing, playing shows in front of people that didn't want to see us or, you know, you know, signing our music over to a fucking detergent commercial or something like we would do desperate things in order to make money. If the only way we could make money was playing music. And I see a lot of bands doing those desperate things and I feel bad for them. Like, it's a shame you had to fucking do that. Like I'm, I I admire Iggy pop tremendously. Like the music of the Stooges meant the world to me growing when I was growing up and, and forming my identity as a musician. The Stooges seemed like an archetypally perfect band. And I got to work with the Stooges and I got to see them in the studio. And it was one of the most satisfying things in my life. I have immense respect for Iggy Pop, right? And for the Stooges. When I hear the song Lust for Life used on a TV commercial for a family cruise line and there's kids playing shuffleboard and (laughs) idiots in a bar drinking uh, you know strawberry daiquiris or whatever and you know like there's a bachelorette party on the pool deck or whatever and lust for life is playing in the background i feel shame for him that you know i'm good for him on getting a payday right but here was a song that was born in a countercultural moment specifically about a countercultural society in Berlin, right? Which was enormously decadent, you know, 
a lot of fucking, a lot of drug taking, a lot of drinking, a lot of people shortening their lives by having a lust for life, which is the, the, the metaphor of the song is that you are harming yourself with all of these hedonistic indulgences, right? And that song was pungent and powerful because of it. A magnificent performance, like terrific band. Everything about it was, was great and powerful and resonant and beautiful. And now people's primary experience of it is watching some pensioners play shuffleboard on the deck of a fucking cruise line where they're all probably going to catch COVID anyway or whatever. You know, it's, it's, it's changed that song and not for the better, right? Well, one of the things that creative people hear all the time, especially young creative people, is that you shouldn't have a plan B. You should put everything into your music and don't look back and don't get a job and don't care about your career. Yeah, that's insane. That's psychotic. <laughs> yeah, that's psychotic thinking. You yeah. should you and should live your life. Living your life means you. if you want to play music, play music. You can play music every day, right? No one can stop you. If you want to put a band together, put a band together, play shows, do all of those things, indulge all of your obsessions. Absolutely. Positively do ab indulge them a hundred percent, but there's no reason not to fucking make, have a job. Like having a job is fucking awesome. Somebody pays you every day. You go and you spend a little time there doing some bullshit they don't want to do. And then at five o'clock you get to leave and come forget about it completely God, I would kill for something like that. Like, you know, you have vacations, two weeks where they pay you and you don't have to go to work. How incredible is that? You can make an album during those two weeks. You can go on tour during those two weeks. You can lay around at home, pet the dog for two weeks. It's amazing. Having a job is awesome, right? <laughs> uh, and yeah, and if you're going to give up your time to somebody else for money, Make them pay you through the nose, like make them pay you as much as you get as much for that as you can. Right. But then when you're playing your music, you can forget completely about whether or not other people like it, which is critical if you're trying to make a living off of it. If you're trying to make a living off of it, you want people to like your music so they'll give you money for it. Right. So suddenly all of your incentives change. You're no longer making music that suits you purely you're trying to make music to suit an audience and you're guessing what they're going to like so you're going to be wrong a lot of the time so you're going to be guessing and wrong and frustrated yeah i think that's psychotic you know there's no shame in having a fucking job it's like everybody has a job it's normal there's no shame in it i guess the tough and, balance that we see a lot in nashville especially is that when someone gives themselves to a job, gives their time and energy, that the uh, corporate greed does not stop at just pay trying to pay you as little as possible, but they also want everything from you, your energy, your creativity, uh, your spirit, really. So trying to balance yeah. that's tough, I think. Yeah, but I, I mean, when I've worked jobs, I have been paid to, to do specific things for a specific amount of time, right? The culture of the workplace never meant a fucking thing to me. And I, I, and I remain like, like I remain firm in the idea that if you allow yourself to get sucked into that sort of thing, that's a, a lever of advantage that the corporate world will have over you. They're going to want you to treat them like family so that they can treat you like an employee, right? Don't fall for it. Like the, I just did a, a record um, with a band called daddy's boy. And they had a song called your job won't love you back, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is incredible. I mean, that's a perfect encapsulation of it. Like, if you're doing a job, you're doing a job, do the job and go home, forget all about it. And, you know, I have another, I have another friend who's a, um, a fishmonger. He's a union fishmonger for a, a supermarket chain. And uh, he ran into the union steward coming out of the bathroom when he was on break. And the union steward grabbed him and he said, did you just take a shit on your break? 
you don't shit on your break. Your break <laughs> is your break. You take a shit on the clock. <laughs> That's good. Advice. I think that, I mean that's a perfectly reasonable at- attitude, you know. One of the um I well we just have a few more questions for you. So I know that how you value your experience as a as a recording engineer um is the, through the relationships that you've built up over the years. And yeah. when you've worked with so many bands over and over and over again, um do you how does it feel like when you, like, for example, you just did that latest mono album and it's one of their best albums of all time. It's like so great. Um, do you ever get worried that uh, these relationships that you've built up over the years, like that the band is going to come up and not deliver an amazing album or do you not care about that? Oh, I don't care about that at all. I mean, the re- they can make whatever kind of record they want. Like, and, and honestly, like I've worked with some bands where um, they they made a, a kind of a conscious left turn at some point and changed their style of music and lost a lot of their audience and, you know, more power to them. And my, in, you know, f- from my perspective, like the more people take ownership, complete ownership of their music, the better, in my opinion. Yeah. I don't, I don't, and when I'm working on a record with somebody, what I want is for them to be satisfied. I want the experience to be good for them. I want them to have the experience that they wanted to have. I want the results to satisfy them. And I want them to feel like they were in control of the process. Um, and beyond that, like if other people like the record when it's done, who cares? Who gives a shit? And so um you wrote this keynote a few years ago. Or you gave this keynote a few years ago about like the state of the industry, and you were talking about um, you know that artists seem to have more control over their future, over their connection with fans. Are you yeah. optimistic about where we're going? Well, at the moment, we're in a weird scenario. We're in a weird position where Spotify has sort of become the market leader in streaming, so they're kind of a dominant player in streaming. Streaming itself is kind of um, a crippled. Uh, form of music enjoyment in my opinion but uh, and Spotify Spotify are a bad actor they're you know they're uh, a terrible company and uh, my bands have removed all of our music from Spotify because we don't want to participate in their business Um, they're deceptive in their practices they do things like create playlists of music that they are 100% owner of so that these playlists will then pay royalties to them. You know, it's like a vertical monopoly where they, um, you know, where they control what people listen to and turns out what people are listening to is music that they get paid for, you know, (laughs) stuff like that. I think, I think it's a, it's a cryptic and, and, and dishonest organization. And I don't, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Um, I do think that streaming is only going to be around for a short period of time because it it seems obvious to me that something autonomous that is not tied to a specific streaming platform is going to be more flexible and more powerful. Once computing power gets very fractionally better, it will be possible to have sort of bots that will scour the web for music for you and play it for you without having to be tied to a particular streaming service or a um, particular rights paradigm. And I think that once that happens, then it's, you know, game over for the streaming services. So the streaming services are trying to smash and grab right now. They're trying to make as much money as they possibly can now um, because that window is going to close eventually. Um, but I do like the way that bands can maintain um very close contact with their fan base now through their web presence and uh, bands can do things like they can promote and sell tours, the tickets to their own tours without having to go through ticket agencies. And that, that makes it more efficient as well. You don't have to have agency fees. Um, There are entire, there are people who do whose entire career now is doing these kind of informal home shows like solo artists that can book a tour where they just go and play informally in people's living rooms. And uh, uh, Dave Bazan uh, from Pedro the Lion was a um, sort of a a pioneer of that method. Like he just had a, a, sorry, he had a newsletter or he had a, a mailing list of people that wanted him to play shows. And he just, 
like does that as a circuit now. Like he just plays in people's homes and they pay him a bunch of money and, and feed him. You know, like if you can get 50 of your friends together uh, in, in a living room someplace, you can have a Pedro the Lion show. I mean, that's kind I've been of incredible. To one. It was great. Yeah. And there are other people, uh, Matt Talbot from the band Hum, he tours in that fashion um, where he just does these informal shows in, you know, people's homes or libraries or public spaces or whatever. Uh, I, I think there's just so many models now, so many more viable models now for bands to and p- musicians to have like a, a sustainable existence that didn't exist during the record label era, you know during the sort of professional era, there were all of these informal ways of doing things just didn't exist. Well, Steve, thank you so much for coming on. This has been awesome. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Devalue. For more information about our podcast, please visit devalue.show.